Now, is this where you first met John Coltrane? Yes, it is. Wow. And yeah. what was your impression of him? Uh, we uh, have the impression that he was a very quiet individual. Very did you, quiet. Did you find that to be into true? Into his music. He was into his music. That was, yeah. What he was about. Music. Yeah. And what was his relationship with Cousin Mary? Were they very, very close? Yeah, they, they were first cousins. They grew up together. Yeah. Um, kind of like cousins, but brother and sister. Brother and sister, right. You know? right. In fact, Cousin Mary was... Cousin Mary was born um, 10 months to the day after him. Yeah. She was born the 23rd of July of... Um, you know, 10 months after him. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she's a great person. She was a school teacher, I believe, at one time. Uh-huh. And um, I was blessed to teach her how to do the bop. Right, you told me that about how to dance inside the house as well. Right. That's amazing, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, was she a musician herself? Uh, no, but she loved the musicians. And she, when she retired from you know, working with the school board. She was telling us that all she want to do is be entertained and hang out with her musician's friends. Right, right. Like one time we were doing a gig, she came to the gig, and a uh, fellow named Richard Adderley, he, he passed on uh, this past year, but he was a vibe player. He was related to Cannonball Adderley. Yeah, yeah. Cousins of yeah. His. And uh, we were uh, Sam Reed, uh, was a bass player, Eddie Harris from Philadelphia, the bass player. Right. And there was a bass player, Sam Reed was on sax, and Alan Nelson was on drums. Uh, the band was called the Elements of Jazz, yeah. we called ourselves. And so we did a gig, and after the gig, you know, the guys would be busting on each other, you know, different, that. and then after the gig was over, I was talking with Cousin Mary, I said, Cousin Mary, I'm, you know, want to apologize for some of my, my crazy friends, she, she said, your crazy friends? Well, what about you? You're the, you're the main one. What are some of your fondest memories about being in this home? Well, playing on the Coltrane, the piano, the, the old uh, upright player piano. Yeah. Pump player piano. Um, uh, uh, cleaning in here. We did a lot of cleaning uh, for some of the, uh, uh, of the uh, um, open houses. Right. That, because that, that uh, Lenora had and um, a lot of things, you know. And, yeah. And just like also um, there were uh, two paintings, I believe, that Coltrane did. It used to be on the wall. That's interesting. In the house. I, that's the first time I heard that. Yeah, some of his own work. Now, did he uh, did he do artwork often? Did he do, uh, there, is there a collection of work that, that he's the, done? I don't know that. But, uh -huh. but these works were like still life. Yeah. I think it was a scene of a of a home with a fence around it and everything. That's interesting to know. Because Miles was a painter as well. Yeah, absolutely. Artist. I know you remember the days of uh, the Loft Jazz scene. Yes. And one of the things that was so amazing about that movement was that it was it involved a lot of experimental music. Yes. And do you subscribe to the notion that we can get back to uh, that place where people can have venues to experiment new sounds and new way of expressing music? Music. What are your thoughts about that? Well, it's 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 it's, it's, it's it hasn't dissipated. It's, it's been going on, you know, throughout. You know, um, and I, I've had friends who, you know, like. Uh, Shafi Hadi, bass player, he used to, you know, play up in the loft so when, when Baraka and Archie Shep, they shared a loft back in the 60s, and um, uh, it's a great, you know, it, it, it's one of the aspects of, of our many faceted uh, experience in music, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, I love it when it's done, like, uh, like Coltrane, um, he and McCoy Tyner, they exhausted musical systems, according to my perspective. And uh, and when I, influenced by people like Albert Eiler and, and, and uh, Cecil, uh, Cecil Taylor and um, um, Eric Dolphy 
and and um, Archie Shipp trained, and then they got he got into uh, the so-called avant-garde. Yeah. But but from the perspective of having learned volumes and volumes of music, he put in hours and hours and studies and studies and study with teachers. You know, um, Roland Wiggins instead of Roland Wiggins, he studied with a Dennis Sandoli in Philadelphia too. But um, uh, and but some people, horn players I know, they just heard the I'm going to go and they just would grab horns and go out and start squeaking and honking, but they never really studied music. I think there should be a, a high standard for that. And I want you to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, John Gilmore. Okay. I was blessed to work with John Gilmore. We had a band. It was John Gilmore, Eba, who played with Sun Ra, played trumpet and French horn and everything. Uh, um, Ron Everett on trumpet. Uh, Sonny Miller on, on, on tenor sax, John Gilmore on, on tenor, um, uh, Shafi Hadi on bass, and his brother Hakim on uh, on um, on trumpet, and Lex Humphreys, the great Lex Humphreys, was on uh, yeah. was on drums. And myself, the band was called the Same Cats. Matter of fact, uh, we had, you know, it was like a, a loft place that we used to shed and rehearse in West Philly. And so we, we gave a concert one time and somebody, Ron Everett, was telling the folks about the gig, you know. And so the person said, ain't you the same cast of us? He said, yeah, so Ron kept the name, so, so we named us the same cast. Yeah. Alfie, it is so good to uh, be back in Philadelphia with you, uh, to talk about your musical history, talk about John Coltrane. Uh, and again, man, I want to thank you so very much for your time. It's my pleasure, and uh, our prayers for to uh, for the John Coltrane House houses in Philadelphia and New York too, and wherever they are on the planet to be able to unite and um, for the better to keep the legacy of Coltrane uh, uh, flourishing and sustaining. Thanks again, Alfie. Man, when I get with you, man, we could just go on and on. No, that's we can't. Why, no, we can't. That's why. No, we can't. That's why I'm coming back. <laughs> no, that's why I'm no, you coming ain't coming back, back here. <laughs> I don't know where you get that from. I'm coming back, man. Cause I gotta get some more. We, I gotta get you to talk a little bit more about some raw. Okay, this is a book called Notes and Tones, written by Alpha Hall, the drummer. Drummer played on Giant Steps. This page here, it, it has a lot of interviews, musician, musician to musician interviews, right? And. Um, so here's one with Elvin Jones, and I had Elvin sign this. Mel, Elvin was doing a master class at the Painted Bride Art Center here in Philadelphia, and I went to it, and I was blessed to sit in with him, you know. But he signed this for me. This is another book. This is Chasing the Train, Coltrane book. Right. And on this page we have um, autographed to myself. Earl Grubbs Sr., uh, Carl Grubbs and Earl Grubbs um, Jr., um, who were John Coltrane's nephews-in-law. His first wife, Naima Grubbs, was uh, Mr. Grubbs' sister. And on this page here, I have uh, the classic quartet, a quartet assigned his image and Elvin Jones signed his here. And this is a event that took place in Philadelphia. McCord Tyner. McCord Tyner, he was yeah. an honoree of Mellon PSFS Jazz Festival, uh, whatever year that was. 1997, okay? All right. Significance of this room that we are playing in right now. Okay, well, this is the 
We're in the Philadelphia Craft Club of Jazz and Performing Arts. Uh, when this building was built from the ground up, initially this was, uh, it was a gift shop, you know. Uh, now it's, it's like a multi-purpose room, you know, I would say. Uh, I would take liberty to say that. And, uh, you know, there's been receptions here, there's been like sometimes caterers, uh, you know, for events taking place in the auditorium. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a wonderful place. It's an outlet for, it's a great uh, institution for young and old to learn about the music, the culture, and, and, and the greatness of, of, of uh, the legacy of, of the luminaries who, who this is, whose shoulders we're standing on. You know, you, you explained to me earlier about the uh, significance of this building as it relates to the uh, musician union. And I want you to talk a little bit about the musician union here in Philadelphia. Okay, well I was blessed to be, um, become a member back in the 50s. Uh, uh, the guy gave me my first gig, his name was Is Nate Murray. And he took me down to 274, which is a local uh, union, which is uh, down the street from here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it near Broadway Carpenter? And the, the day I joined the union, uh, Nate and I went down there, and Jimmy Smith was there. It was a black uh, musicians union, and it was uh, there was a white musicians union called 77, local 77, and. and that union, like people from the Philadelphia Orchestra, the members of that uh, belong to that union. Now, 274 musicians uh, in different, various types of music. In fact, my father, I, I'm not sure if he was a member of, of that or the uh, um, union, but he was a member of the Philadelphia Concert Orchestra, which was a black symphony orchestra. And some of the members um, of the Clef Club have been members of the Philadelphia Council Orchestra. So tell me about your earliest experience uh, playing on the instrument. Was piano your very first instrument? It was my first instrument, you know. Then also, you know, we used to play a water hole. I played like some shower, the rubber shower joints. Mm -hmm. Play, exactly. like, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, scrub boards. Scrub boards, which I yeah. try to make the uh, the uh, wash wash tub base and exactly. Things, and you know, we banged on stuff and you know. Yeah. Now, growing up in Philadelphia, tell me a little bit about the stories uh, when people talk about walking the bar. I know that's uh, uh, something that's very uh, Philadelphia-based. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, some stories about walking the bar. Well, I mean, a lot of musicians, that, so I've been told, had walked the bar in order to, you know, not only be a musician, you have to be an entertainer. Right. So that was part of entertainment during that time. Uh, John Coltrane did that. Lynn Hope was really known for that. Uh, um, Lynn Hope was a musician who um, uh, was the first, as far as what I, to my understanding, he was the first African American, uh, North American, black to make the Hajj in, in Mecca. Yeah. Back in the forties, yeah. you know, and he was he would play. He would wear a turban on his head. He played tennis sax. He would play at the showboat. Theater brought in the lumber a few blocks from here, and uh, be crowds around the corner to get in there to see him. You know, yeah, uh, black and white. Uh, you know, as well. You know. So now coming up, when was your very first paid gig? Uh, when I worked with Nate Murray, I think I played at a place called the Gaiety Cafe, which was on, uh, I think it might be May Street in Lancaster, right near 47, 46, around that way. Yeah, you know, yeah. A bar. And the bar had a piano on it, and the piano had like uh, uh, some of the keys where you could see cigarette burns in the keys. Uh, seemed like, but I don't know if people that you know, spilled drinks in, 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 the, in the body in, inside the works of the piano or what have you. But it was like, you know, you could mess your hands up playing on some of the raggedy pianos, but it was, I didn't have to carry anything. It was, yeah. But then worked with Nate, we used to do gigs where like we, we, we say we'd be working like Nate and Carl and Earl Grubbs and us, we work say like the Sportsman Lounge at Sixties and Market, right? And we'd be there for like a, a a month, so we would rent a piano from Cunningham Piano Company. They would bring a piano in, yeah, you know, for that month, you know. And sometimes it would, you know, a lot of people would come sit in with us, and the piano wouldn't wouldn't hold up and be, you know, get messed up, 
people banging on yeah. the piano and stuff. Yeah. You mentioned Curl and all, all Carl Grubbs, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell uh, the folks that are on Facebook Live who Earl and Carl Grubbs were. Okay, well, Earl Grubbs Jr. and Carl Grubbs, they, they, uh, uh, Earl is, is uh, he's no longer with us, but Carl is with us, and uh, their father, Earl Grubbs Sr., had a sister. His sister's name was Naima Grubbs. And Naima Grubbs was John Coltrane's first wife. And uh, uh, Earl and Carl, they lived in North Philly, grew up in North Philadelphia, on Thompson Street, and uh, not far from the Coltrane house. And they used to go visit their Uncle Johnny um, at, in Philadelphia, and also at the Coltrane house up in New York, wherever Coltrane was living at that time. I'm not exactly sure. Yes, yeah, I understand. And I so, understand. But they would go and visit their Uncle Johnny, and he took a liking to them, and he shared music with them. And uh, they, they would come and show us uh, their contemporaries, uh, um, you know, stuff like Giant Steps, of course, the Giant Steps. Yeah. You know, yeah. like Sunny, different songs. And so one day, Earl and Carl, I was over at the house, they said, you know, uh, Uncle John is going to be over at the house on 33rd Street. Would you like to go? And I said, yeah. So we went over there. I met Train. I met his mother. And that's when I first met him. But I sent him my song to, when the, the, uh, the album was out, A Kind of Blue. I saw that band, you know. Yeah. You know. I'm going to play something uh, that you would have had learned from the grubs. Okay. first piece was like Giant Steps. I played it in three, four times, five yeah. times, mm -hmm. you know, a little, you know, like to experiment with music. You exactly. Know. Um, um, the second piece was uh, um, uh, Cousin Mary. Cousin Mary, exactly. Cousin Mary. Exactly. Cousin Mary. Love the cousin John Coltrane, something like that. Yeah. Somebody wrote this lyrics. I don't know if it's Oscar Brown Jr. or who it wrote. Yeah. A lot of what John Coltrane played crossed over into R&B, into rock, and, uh, and so his significance is not only in jazz, and I think you illustrated it very well. Give me another example how uh, some of the John Coltrane chords and some of his melodies crossed over into other genres. Okay, let's see here.
chord changes in that song could be I'm Falling in Love, written by Melvin Mervyn Steeles, uh, recorded on the Spinners, uh, had Coltrane changes and uh, honestly. West chord change is similar type chord change movement. Billy and, and, and Norman Connors and, and myself and other, other, other musicians, Robert Kenyatta and yeah. Gerald Roberts, we all used to hang down at a place called Rittenhouse Square, which was the Philadelphia's counterpoint to Washington Square in the Greenwich Village in the right. And where, you know, there's some called beatniks and uh, the nonconformists and all the kind of stuff. We, we, we participated in some of that kind of movement and, and the black, black arts movement, the civil rights movement, black power movement, all that. Yeah. Um, so now how did you fit in in terms of uh, music style? What kind of stuff were you playing at that time? During that time, well, Norman and myself and others, Alan Nelson, we were playing, we were fans of, and Disciples of the John Coltrane experience. Yeah. So we, we tried to play, and Earl Carl Gross, we played a lot of Coltrane type music. We dug Bird, we dug Monk, we dug uh, Sonny Rollins. Um, yeah, you know, and, and because of uh, the dexterity, if you will, of uh, a lot of the Philadelphia musicians, you know, you're playing at this club, uh, this real eclectic place in Philadelphia. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Billy Paul has this hit record, Me and Mrs. Jones. Mm -hmm. And then uh, soon thereafter, Norman Collins has a huge hit, You Are My Starship. Mm -hmm. And they're going in different directions. And so what was on your mind at that time? Well, I was like, kind of like stunned because we were, we were staunch so-called straight ahead jazz yeah, players, yeah. players and singers and, and what have you. And then, uh, I start thinking like, if they're getting into this and they, there must be something to this. So I, I start studying some of this stuff and I self-taught myself yeah. from the, listening to the Mighty Love album, The Spinners. The Spinners, right. Uh, Blue Magic's first album. And, yeah. Uh, Lovers and Magic. It's Love, is, Love is the uh, message. Yeah. Uh, Philadelphia Sound. Phil and my best be. Yeah, you go. So I self-taught myself some stuff. And, yeah. When you say you taught yourself some stuff, Give me an idea of the stuff you were working on uh, musically. Give me an indication on the piano, okay. some of the things you were working on. Well, um, Mighty Love, I had to learn how to by ear. Yeah. Pick it up, pick yeah. it up, not, you know, like.
people uh, and, and acknowledging and uh, celebrating ourselves, people of African descent, and the entire world, you know, uplifting uh, humanity, uh, fallen humanity, and, uh, you know, putting our best feet forward to for uh, healing for us all.